All right, where I go, Elizabeth? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's talk, Perfuming with Essential Oils. Tonight's talk is sponsored by Now Foods Canada. Our speaker this evening is Talia Charney. Talia Charney's lifelong passion for all things nutrition and health, healthy living make her the ideal nutrition and health educator for Now Health Canada. With over 30 years in the, in the health industry, her formal training, as well as personal and professional experience, form a strong basis for her speaking and education. Her experience includes an eclectic background in herbal medicine, nutrition, essential oils, green living, meditation, vegetarian cooking, and working as a wellness coach, fitness instructor, and personal trainer. Talia is also the author of two books, The Confident Shopper, The Guide to Food Labels and Fables, as well as recently released The Expert Patient, Health is Not a Spectator Sport. These books are available at Healthy Planet and also online. So this evening, I just want to point out a couple of little housekeeping uh, pieces. At the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, perhaps at the side, you may see a question and answer bubble. Do an A, two little bubbles. If you could please put your question in that section, that would be fantastic. And if we can keep our questions just short, that way Talia will be able to get to as many questions as she can in the answer uh, time at the end of the talk. And in the chat bubble, I will be posting all sorts of links, places that you can find recipes. So with that, I just want to go to Kelly Shani. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And hello, welcome everybody. I'm just uh, going to take a second here to make sure that uh, get something out of the way to just make sure that we're recording. Yep, we are recording so that you will all get you all get to see the recording um, at the end. Um, not sure when it comes to you, but you will get an email from Healthy Planet so you can relax and watch everything uh, and know that you, you know, to take notes that you can watch it again. Um, and also, if you feel like it, if it's helpful to you, you can have your phone ready and you can snap pictures of any slides that you might find as a helpful reference afterwards. So just a quick disclaimer, uh, this presentation is for general informational purposes only, it doesn't constitute the practice of medicine or aromatherapy, and the use of the information written or stated here or any materials linked from here is at the user's own risk. All suggested uses for essential oils can be found on the products themselves. All right, so let's get to the fun stuff. I'm not going to go, go through some kind of gruesome history about perfumes, but just a little bit of background that's fun and interesting before we dive into the topic. Just that essential oils in general and perfumes have a very long history, going back at least uh, 2000 years that we know of. Maybe the most recognizable story when it comes to essential oils, of course, is uh, the wise man bringing baby Jesus, the frankincense and myrrh. So they were of value back then and they're still of value today. The startings of perfume were very interesting. So the first, the original perfumes were uh, from amber, uh, yellow amber and gray amber. Yellow amber was a, is the resin of a tree. And of course, now you can get, if you can afford real amber jewelry, uh, as well as the, um, another one of the original ambers actually came from the inside of the whale. And that's a, in a in not so nice term, it's known as whale vomit. Um, but sometimes dead whales were found and there's this um, amber came from within their bodies. So that was really interesting. As you can imagine, these original perfumes were hard to come by and very expensive and just really only for royalties. They weren't accessible to us ordinary people. 
And so eventually it was discovered that you could synthesize these chemicals that were you know, very similar or identical or by combining them and make perfumes that were much more accessible to the public and much more affordable. Uh, maybe until prestige perfumes came along that is. And then today it's sort of evolved. We have all kinds of variations of perfume, which I'm using loosely. So different types of body scents. Uh, we have what we would call just perfume. We've got eau de toilette, we've got eau de cologne, we have a um, uh, splash here and aftershave. And if you look uh, here, these are actually all identical in their ingredients. The only thing that's different is the ratios or the amounts. So our perfume has more of that fragrance oil or in the case of tonight, we're talking about essential oils that give the fragrance, but in this case, the um, uh, synthetic uh, fragrances. So it has more and then eau de toilette has less, considerably less, and eau de cologne and splash and aftershave. And uh, as that content gets lower and lower, people tend to use it on more and more of their body when it's less concentrated. One of the things that may be inhibiting people from buying perfumes is the cost. And it is quite startling. There's a, the reason that modern day prestige perfumes cost so much is not because they're so hard to come by and like the original perfumes, but it's more of just their, the model, the, the sales model of the marketing model. We think of if it's really expensive, it must be great. And, uh, but the ingredients actually on average only cost one to $2, if you can believe for prestige perfume, less than 1% of the retail cost. And the bottle or the box of the display around it usually costs a lot more than the ingredients. There's another reason why consumers might not want to use these fragrances, especially the prestige perfumes. The environmental working groups is a great website if you ever want for all things, you know, evaluating chemicals, whether it's cleaning products or foods, anything like that. The environmental working group researchers uh, said that greater than 75% of products of these perfumes that list the ingredient fragrance contain phthalates. And if you haven't heard of phthalates, they are a controversial, um, controversial type of chemical that has come to be known for these adverse, potential adverse reactions like disrupting hormones, affecting fertility, potentially increasing the risk for certain cancers and so on. And here also of interest. So in a lab test commissioned by the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, they found that 38 unlabeled chemicals were in 17 name brand fragrances. So like Coco Chanel, 18 were not listed, uh, Britney Spears and, and so on. I have honestly, I've never bought a perfume before. So um, maybe those of you have this, you can relate to this more. And so it's no surprise based on those two things. And the reason that I'm doing this talk tonight is that um, consumers are demanding more natural fragrances. This is US statistics, but I'm sure it's very closely followed in Canada. Natural fragrances are much higher demand than these prestige fragrances. All right, and then also just before I dive right into the perfumes, just for those of you who don't know anything about essential oils, I want to tell you just a little bit. So essential oils are, they're named for the essential, they're the essence of the plant. And it's the essence because it gives the aroma. And we all associate the essence of the rose, for example, by the smell. Essential oils are volatile. So they are um, not buoyant, but yeah, they go up into the air so we can smell them. They're fragrant. They attract insects and other living things, they also actually uh, repel them in some ways so they can act as natural pesticides. But most importantly, they're extremely concentrated. The essential oils that, that I'm talking about in terms of we've now put them in a bottle. 
And to illustrate that, so it takes approximately 150 lemon rinds just to make this one bottle of lemon. So highly concentrated. And another example would be one drop of peppermint essential oil would be the amount that you might get from approximately steeping 20 bags of peppermint tea at one time, which you would never do. So highly concentrated, um, keep that in mind. Now for today's purposes, there's many ways you can use essential oils, but we're talking about scents and perfumes. So we're talking about inhaling. And therefore I want to emphasize that when you do inhale the essential oils, that are in the air, um, they do pass through the olfactory system and are able to uh, affect parts of our brain that are very primal, that are responsible for our memory, for our learning, for our emotion. I'm sure you've heard that um, smell is one of the most powerful triggers of memory. Um, I know music is, is one as well. And, you know, from the brain, it's possible that there are a sort of cascade, cascade of effects to our nervous system and affecting hormones in our body as well. And just in case you're curious about how do we get essential oils, so the vast majority of essential oils are coming from a process called steam distillation, where uh, we have the plant material, and the essential oils, which again, they're very volatile, so they go up and they are cooled and they settle down, leaving um, the rest of the plant material behind and just this concentration. So that's how most essential oils are made. Citrus essentials are pressed. That's how they're made. So technically they're not essential oils, but we just call them essential oils because you know, for all intents and purposes, but they're pressed, so a little different. There's a couple of essential oils that happen to be my favorite, which technically are also not essential oils. They're called absolutes. And those are jasmine and rose. They're made with uh, solvents like alcohol because they're so delicate, we cannot make them with steam distillation or by other means. Uh, that would be way too costly uh, as, as it is even now. If you want a bottle of pure rose, a tiny little, you know, a, a bottle about like this small might cost you over a hundred dollars. So then it's like prestige perfumes. And we have, um, and there's one, one essential oil, at least that, that I have that's um, extracted by carbon dioxide. So that's a little bit about that. We're putting essential oils on, uh, you're putting them on your body or and you're inhaling them, you want to have quality. So just to let you know that there is no mystery to how we test essential oils in terms of quality. There are some really core tests like gas chromatography you can see here and infrared spectrum that really just act like a fingerprint to compare what you're testing to what you're expecting to make sure you have exactly the, uh, the, the exact quantities and types of chemicals that you're looking for so that you know you have a pure product. And there's a lot of other tests um, that I'm not showing here that are done as well on uh, these products. And just one other thing I wanna say about quality is if you've heard of the term therapeutic grade anywhere, you ever heard that you should get therapeutic grade essential oils because they're safer or they're better or whatever that is, just wanted to explain a myth about that. So what does therapeutic grade means? By definition, it means that you have this third party, so the subjective third party, pharmacopedia, or some kind of statutory organization, and they've, they've created this monograph that sets the standards as to um, what you need in order to obtain that title therapeutic grade. So that's what it means. But in reality, there is no such statutory organization or anything like that when it comes to essential oils to date. So it's really just a marketing term. And it has no bearing, if someone says their essential oils are therapeutic grade, it has no bearing on quality or purity or safety. The only thing that has bearing is those uh, tests that I mentioned.
All right, so on to the fun part, the art of perfuming. Um, I do a lot of talks and I love to do something that's really light and fun. So, so perfuming is an art in the sense that there is a, a certain way of doing it, although as you'll learn, there's a flexibility. But if you want to learn how to blend essential oils, then uh, the, the art of perfuming involves what we call notes. So for those of you who are musical and play the piano, C is a note and E is a note and G is a note. So we have these single notes. When you're blending a perfume, you need to pick different notes, but the notes by themselves don't really give you that end impression. It's how you put those notes together. So if we put a C and an E and a G together on the piano, what we get is an accord, or as they call it in the perfuming, an accord, which means agreement. So these things go together well, like a bouquet of flowers. Um, and so this is essentially what you need to know in order to blend your perfumes. You have to figure out which notes to pick and how to make a nice chord. So there are three types of notes in perfumes that typically you're going to blend together. You're going to pick notes that are referred to as the top notes, or if you think of the higher note on the piano, the middle note, and the bass note or the lower note. Now there's um, different information out there. So um, various websites or authorities will um, mention different ratios in terms of how much should be top note or middle note or bass note. Don't get too caught up in that, but on the average, about half of the formula is going to be made up of the middle notes. So that's sort of the core, the heart. And then um, next would be the top notes and usually the bass notes make up the smallest amount. And that is sort of in a nutshell, the art of perfuming, putting together top, middle and bass notes in that certain ratio. So what are the top notes? Your top notes are like your first impression. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. So citrus is a common top note. And there's a reason why we use citrus in so many room sprays, because if you want, uh, you want people to notice it right away. It's that first impression, it's a sharp tone, it's characteristic feature. Uh, but it dissipates really quickly. So that's what the top notes are. It's, you notice them right away, but they disappear fairly fast. So in a perfume, that's the scent that you're going to notice right away. It's quite characteristic of that perfume. But, you know, maybe 30 minutes later, you won't notice it anymore. But what you will notice a little bit later is the middle notes. The middle notes are the heart of the aroma. They're like that summer romance. So they last a little bit longer, but not forever. Although we didn't really see what happened after the end of Greece. Maybe Danny and Sandy did get together. So that's the middle notes. Then you have the bottom notes. Those last the longest. So that, that's your, you know, your long-term relationship. They are the sort of grounding um, of the whole formula. And they can last up to 24 hours. So those are the three types of notes that you will uh, put into a perfume. Now, uh, and I didn't mention as we go, Elizabeth, who's a lovely moderator right now, is probably chatting with you. Um, and again, do remember to put your questions in the Q&A, although you can chat uh, with Elizabeth. Um, so she will share with you, um, perhaps she'll share all these links at the end as well, but in the chat group, she may now share this particular link uh, from nowfoods.ca. And this is really going to be, you can print this up whenever you have time. This is going to be your core, um, your core aid to, to put your perfumes together. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining this. As you can see, we have your top notes your middle notes and your bass notes. 
So here are all the essential oils listed that are top notes, that are middle notes, and that are base notes. And so essentially you're gonna be combining some top notes, some middle notes, and some base notes in a particular ratio. That's one thing I wanted you to notice. Um, and then if we look, um, we also have broken down here, we've got floral and aromatic uh, notes and citrusy notes, minty notes, medicinal notes, herbal green, earthy notes, spicy notes, and woodsy notes. So um, what you can do is start with by picking a favorite scent. For me, it was definitely uh, rose or jasmine. That, those are my absolute, so those are gonna be in my middle notes. And then what this chart also shows you is what do those scents match well with if you're trying to figure out how to, to blend them. So um, these are, again, my, my two favorite. And if I look here, it says blends well with spicy, citrus, and woodsy. Okay, so I'm gonna have my jasmine and my rose. And now I need to pick something uh, either spicy, citrusy, or woodsy. Um, so I've got my, my middle note there. Um, something spicy, those are also middle notes. Something woodsy. Ah, sandalwood. I'm going to combine those with sandalwood. Now I have uh, uh, my bottom notes. So maybe I'll get two of them, atlas and sandalwood, and, and so on. So you just use this to pick your top, middle, and base notes. And you use these guidelines here, blends well with, if you're not sure what to pick next. But really, these are just guidelines. So you can combine any you want together. Um, you don't even have to have top, middle, and base notes. You could just make a perfume out of lavender if you want. But it's, it's nice to experiment with the, the art of perfuming. So just a little bit more of a, a close up because that chart is kind of small. Just wanted to show you. So um, for the top notes, you will notice that um, you got lavender and, and uh, spike lavender here. This is jasmine, which is my absolute favorite scent. Um, but many of the floral, the flowery type, the aromatic, uh, the sweet notes lie in the top and middle. You don't have those kind of flowery or someone called granny smell, which I don't know if that's a good thing to call it. Um, you don't have many of those in the base except vanilla. And citrus, as I said, it's that first impression, those top notes, all top notes, so that's easy to remember. Minty, also easy to remember that they're top notes because they form the, the sort of the flavors of many of our breath fresheners or mouthwashes because we want them to work quickly. And again, to have that first impression of that fresh breath and such, so those are in the top notes and they blend well with, and you have a list. Um, medicinal notes. So um, the koala bear actually is, I think it's the only animal, animal that lives off um, eucalyptus as its, as its full diet. Medicinal notes, not many people want to smell like a spa on their body, but you never know, we're all different. So they're certainly distinct. The herby green notes, very much all in the middle, except for basil. So these are what I call the Italian spices, right in the middle. We've got the earthy notes, almer, patchouli, uh, and, and vetiver. Yeah, you know, spicy notes, look at that. All of those kind of uh, the Halloween <laughs> type or the um, pumpkin spices as we call them are all there right in the middle. And then in the middle and the bottom, we have uh, many of those, either the needles or the woods. Uh, and the great thing about these is that they blend well with all. So they're very versatile. Now you don't need to run out and buy 100 essential oils if you've never done them before, but what I encourage you to do is to pick, you know, look at the, the list and pick one or two of your favorite top notes, one or two of your favorite middle notes, and one of two of your favorite bottom notes, and you can start from there. Okay, so just uh, examples here, putting this together of some recipe examples. 
So here we have, well, I just named this fresh, spicy, and sweet. An example where we've got uh, my top note I picked is grapefruit. The middle notes I picked are ginger and geranium, and then the bottom notes of vanilla and vetiver. And the amounts, now in this case, this is not uh, drops, this is not drops, it's, it's parts. So I'm just giving the ratios. We're gonna get into the, the details about how many drops, but the ratios, so three parts grapefruit and, and so on. And I've got um, the representation of that top, middle and base notes. Or another example here, sweet and spicy. Um, got the orange top notes, that citrus in my middle notes, neroli and cardamom. And in this case, decided not to have a base note, just to show you that you don't always have to follow the formula. You're gonna figure out your own blends that you like, and that's fine. Or in this case as well, I didn't have middle notes, but uh, this peace and quiet, we've got two parts lavender oil at the top and four parts frankincense to kind of ground that. Um, now I call this Talia's perfect blend because this is one that I created myself. Now I sort of, to be honest, I kind of wing it. So I don't know if I make it exactly this way, but this is approximate. It's heavy on the rose and jasmine because those are my favorite. And we've got vanilla in the base and I love lime of all the citrus. I love the smell of lime. Uh, notice here that these are absolutes and that they are um, not pure. I um, mean, they're blended with jojoba oil. Uh, and that's a good thing to me because I don't want to be paying $200 or $100 for a tiny bottle. And rose and jasmine actually are quite strong. Um, I can smell them more easily in these blends than I can some other pure essential oils. So they work really well, uh, in my opinion, for making perfumes. And another thing you can do is consider using a pre-blend. So I picked this power to flower because I like it and I have it. I think it's got some, I think it's a nice safe blend. And um, also you can take a blend like this one and then you can add something else to the blend. Uh, for example, I could add in some extra base notes here or really flexible. Okay, so now that I've shown you some examples of blends, I want to explain to you um, more about uh, how do you test out a blend or the perfect blend. So there's a, a number of things, and this is where it becomes an interesting art. What determines the end result of your blend? Firstly, it's going to be based on, obviously, on the notes that you select. But you might think in your head, oh, these notes are perfect, but when you blend them together in the accord, um, they might not uh, smell the same way that you thought together. So that's also gonna determine the end result that mixed together. Also our unique body chemistry. So a perfume that uh, maybe smells amazing on your friend or your partner might not smell the same on your skin for all kinds of different reasons, including how dry, our skin is a moist or other things like that. The age of the perfume. So perfumes like wines definitely change with age. Um, so your perfume may smell different the day you make it, one week later, six months later, hopefully it's not sitting around for that long. And the carrier that you select. So what do you put that, those essential oils in? That could also affect the end smell. Now you can see it's getting a little more interesting, a little more complicated. So here's um, a way that you can test. Now you don't have to test your, you can just jump right in. If that's your personality, go for it and just mix your essential oils and I'll get to how to do that. But because they are, you know, they're expensive, you don't wanna waste them. It's nice to be able to do a little testing. So not what I have here is what you see in the picture are test strips. Um, now I, I bought these online, but honestly, these are just, um, these are just card quality. So they're just a little thicker than regular paper. You can just buy, um, sort of thick paper and cut it yourself. 
but here are the strips. And what you do is you want to take uh, each one of your essential oils, uh, label it on the bottom just so you don't uh, forget. So today I labeled these ginger, vetiver, vanilla, um, grapefruit, put a drop on each, and then I you know, walked in the front five inches from my nose. Um, now it's a few hours later, it smells a little different, and I might want to try it the next day as well, because it just to give them a little bit of age. And so that's gonna give you an idea of, oh, okay, how does that blend smell? You might think, oh, I'm not really smelling that top note that I wanted or, or one of those smells is overpowering and you might try a few different variations before you make your perfume. All right. Um, and next you can uh, make the mixture and try it out on your body. So of course, to see the body chemistry if you want. And when you put it on your body, you might see what it's like right away, wait 30 minutes, also wait a day or so. I'm gonna take a sip of water here. Alternative, if you don't have these strips is, and I'm not gonna take the lids off of the bottles here because I don't need to just show you, but you can open your bottles. Now, if you're making a perfume with uh, you know, 20 essential oils, you won't be able to hold this, but if you're just trying three, you can just go like that. It's not, you know, it's not as a perfect a system, but it can work and you can smell them, try to get a whiff of them all together and see hmm, if you like it. All right, so that's step one. Step two is you can make small batches. So let's say you have uh, tested on your strips, you really like the smell. You wanna make small batches. Unless you're a connoisseur at this, make small batches, trust me, because you do not wanna waste. So what you will do, um, now I have these uh, nice amber bottles, glass. You wanna put essential oils in glass ideally. And I would make small batches of this mixture that I like. So we're looking at the mixture here. So I could uh, take, you know, two drops grapefruit, vetiver, one drop of ginger, one drop of vanilla, but I probably wanna make a little bit more than that. So I might make, you know, maybe three or four or five times this formula just relying on the ratio here. So let's say I'm making double, I'll put two times two, so I'll put four drops of grapefruit, two vetiver, two ginger, and two vanilla, and so on. Make a, a little mixture here so that I can mix them all together, blend those essential oils. Um, and then you could even dilute a small amount in oil, so in this case, say in jojoba oil, rub it on your skin and also see what it smells like then or a day later. So that's how you just kind of make a small batch and, uh, and, and try to label it some way. That's step, through, uh, step two. Now you can skip both of those steps and go straight to filling up your bottle, whatever you have with your carrier. And I'm gonna get to the carriers, let's say oil. Uh, and just put your essential oils in and just go for it. Um, so those, but those steps again, just assure that it, you may have a better chance of getting a good perfume. Now there's two types, and I, I make these as well. There's two types of uh, perfumes. Uh, you can make one that's a spray, which is what you're looking at here. I'm just gonna, I know you can't smell it, but so the spray and there's um, roller bottle. You put a little bit on. What's great about these for beginners, and I assume most of you are beginners, is they're small and you don't want to waste and you don't want to make huge batches. Also, when you make small batches, they will stay um, better longer, right? If you make a huge batch, it could go, um, it could deteriorate depending on how you make it. So the, this type of container, um, uh, an atomizer has glass inside. You want the essential oils to be in contact with glass because they could break down plastics. Um, it has a metal outside. This will help really preserve it so it's, uh, there's no exposure to oxygen uh, or to light so that uh, it can last longer. So that's an alcohol-based perfume uh, that you can make in here. And I'm gonna get to how. And for a roller, you want a oil. So it's an oil-based. And here I've just given you an example of if we want to make a 
3% blend, 3% essential oils in there, we'd put three drops in this five ml container and six drops in uh, this 10 ml roll on to make a 3% blend. Uh, and that's a pretty safe dilution. And I'm going to get more into the dilutions. Now, this is the hard part, especially when you're dying to try it. So you've just made your perfumes. You want to let those essential oils get to know each other, to mingle. And the longer you leave them, the better. There's no perfect time. Online, you'll read, you know, wait a day, wait seven days, wait two weeks. Try to wait a few days at least, and you can keep smelling it and seeing how it changes as it goes. But let it linger a little bit before you, you judge it. Now, um, going to play you a video that I made. Um, hold on a second, I have to go back one slide so I can get rid of that. Okay. So I'm going to play you a video that I made. Uh, very short, but what this is basically going to show you is why am I suggesting to either make your perfume in oil or in alcohol versus many other things you might see online. Just demonstrating here the solubility of essential oils in different liquid mediums. So if you're trying to make some kind of do-it-yourself homemade products, your essential oils need to be properly mixed so that uh, they don't especially cause harm by having huge globs of it uh, contact with your face or your skin. So as you can see, the essential oil and water, and I use German chamomile here because it's easy to see, it is completely insoluble, just floats on the top. It does not mix, so that is not a good medium. If you take that water and you add some vegetable glycerin, that definitely helps. You can see it's broken up the uh, essential oils into smaller globules, so it's definitely an improvement. And if you shake that product before you use it um, and then immediately use it, that will help a little bit but it doesn't compare to putting essential oils into any kind of liquid fat um, so, or fatty base because it is soluble in fat. So this is a liquid coconut oil in this case and it is completely mixed. Alcohol is another very good medium that will help solubilize the essential oil. So it is fully mixed in the alcohol, but the alcohol content has to be high enough. So the higher, the better. As you get close to 100%, it works better. Vodka does not work as well. Witch hazel, which many people tout as being uh, good, actually does not work well. You can see here, although it doesn't float on the top, it's all stuck to the sides. Now, the, the caveat here is that- Okay, I'm just gonna stop that there, actually. Um, what I was about to say is, um, that so the reason that witch hazel is often touted as being um, helpful is because it usually is in a base of alcohol. But if you get like I have here, if you get an alcohol free witch hazel, you notice that it doesn't work at all. And that's because witch hazel is not good. It, it, it's only the alcohol part. And even witch hazel that's mixed in alcohol typically doesn't have enough alcohol to have much of an impact anyway. So that explains that. Oh. All right. So I hope that explained to you why um, it's important, especially when you're again applying to your body or, uh, yeah, to your body. I mean, if you're just spraying something in the room and it's not fully mixed, it's may not be as effective, but it's not going to be necessarily harmful to you. So oil blends. So I'm gonna talk about the oil blends first. As I said, you know, the oils, what you could put in a roller. Um, you can also make a solid thicker perfume, but oh, let's go back to my little 
highlighter here, which I like. Oh, that's not what I meant. That's fine. So um, it's very simple in a sense how to make an oil blend. All you do is you add your essential oils to the glass roller bottle at the bottom is the easy way. And then you just top it off all the way to the top with the oil. So, I mean, it's really that simple uh, in one sense. My, yeah. And really, you could use any oil, any liquid oil under the sun. So if you want to just start with whatever you have at home, you can. But the best oils to use, in my opinion, are either jojoba oil, liquid coconut oil, or almond oil. My favorite being jojoba oil, but I will use others. Jojoba oil is, uh, it's actually a wax, it's not truly an oil. And because of this property, it has an incredibly long shelf life. So your perfume will, that oil will not go rancid for years. Uh, and that makes it really ideal. It also is pretty, pretty neutral smelling. And well, when things go rancid, of course you can smell them and that's gonna affect the smell of your perfume. So I love jojoba, but liquid coconut oil is also another great option because uh, this, at least this fractionated one has no scent. The scent has been removed and it's also pretty stable. And almond oil is another popular cho uh, choice and a neutral smelling. Um, so any of those three, but you don't want to take something like a sesame oil or an olive oil, something that has a distinct smell, that's going to overpower your blend. So that is uh, for the oil blend option. Well, some people might make solid perfumes. I'm not going to get into that and I've never made it, but that certainly is another option for oil based where it would disperse uh, well. And the great thing about oil based perfumes is they are so easy to make, very accessible. Everyone can find oil anywhere. And it does stay longer on your skin. The, so that oil has a way of kind of fixing the smell to your skin which is why you know some, if you have very dry skin and you don't have that moisture the perfume won't last as long so just by having an oil it will have a little bit more staying power what about alcohol blends now uh actually the first time i ever made my own perfume was alcohol blend and i like the alcohol blends so alcohol based scent um basically is going to, for our purposes or for your purposes, is going to contain three ingredients. Alcohol, preferably distilled water. I've always used tapped water, tap water, but you know, I, distilled water is the gold standard and your essential oil. So in that sense, it's kind of simple, um, but there are a few things to know. So what are the benefits of uh, alcohol? One is it preserves, so it's a, it's a natural preservative. So that's uh, good. Uh, you want have little critters growing in your perfumes, even after a long period of time. Uh, it has to be a certain um, percentage of alcohol. It also, as I showed you, it solubilizes, so it's going to help mix those essential oils nicely. Uh, it stabilizes, so it helps uh, kind of fix those scents so they stay longer. And this term it was something new to me improved silage. So, silage is, is sort of like the um, when you spray, it's that, uh, that movement of the scent around you that you can't get from an oil base, if that makes sense. Uh, there are some cons though of alcohol. It is very drying to the skin. So that may not be good if somebody, you know, if you have a skin condition or your skin is very dry, if you're applying it to large surfaces of your skin, something alcohol-based, it can be drying, you know, say uh, men with their aftershave and the alcohol, or some women use uh, toners for their face that are alcohol-based, it can be very drying. So it depends on your skin type. It also evaporates quickly. So it smells great when I spray it on, but alcohol evaporates. The scent certainly doesn't last as long. And it's a little bit less available in the sense that the type of alcohol that's the gold standard for you to use is not something you can just walk into your uh, whatever store it is. Here we have in Ontario, the LCBO that sells alcohol. Um, they won't usually have it and they won't usually sell it to you. So uh, you can get it. I've gotten some in the past, 
Um, you may be able to by writing a letter and saying, you know, I make perfumes or whatever it is. I'm not sure how easy it is uh, to get in your particular area. Um, but so, I, uh, so here's a list of um, types of alcohol that are the gold standard to use when making perfumes because you want at a minimum of 75% alcohol, but ideally even higher. I found this global alcohol, that's not a typo, that's how it is. Um, so this exists in, in Toronto, it is sold, but again, I'd have to get a sort of a permission. Um, that was the brand here. But I did make my perfumes using just this isopropyl alcohol, um, which typically people will say, you know, don't use, you don't want to use that because you can smell the alcohol and it's not great, etc. For my uh, particular brand, blend that I mentioned, it works fine. I don't mind it at all. It, the, I think the alcohol evaporates, so I didn't mind. And if you want to experiment uh, without spending a lot or worrying about trying to get alcohol, you can just try that. Uh, many people do uh, recommend many, many um, online recipes will recommend vodka. The problem with vodka is it doesn't meet this minimum of 75%. And as I showed you in that video, it's not very good at solubilizing. Uh, oh, here I actually took a picture to show you. So I took pure vodka, so I didn't mix it with anything. I compared it to the isopropyl alcohol, which I actually had even diluted two parts water and one part alcohol, and it still worked a lot better. You can see the essential oils completely mixed into it. So, you know, with vodka, again, you might, if you shake something up before you spray it, it might disperse a bit better. Um, I guess the, possibly you could not fill your containers to the top so that there is some room for it to shake before being sprayed. Um, and that's maybe a workaround, but definitely it's ideal to have a higher alcohol content. So in terms of, um, now again, online, you'll find all kinds of dis different recipes. This is the one that I use and I would recommend for beginners and I'll get more into the why. So to have about 75% uh, alcohol. So, you know, this is gonna be about up to there, about 25% or a little less of the water, and then the essential oils. And you can put the essential oils in first, so that makes it a bit easier to, to top off. Um, that is the percentage that I could recommend, just 3% of essential oils. This is close to what you'd get in an eau de cologne rather than a perfume. I showed you at the beginning, the perfumes are uh, perfumes that you find out on the shelves commercially can be 20, 30, 40% of the, um, well, they don't use the essential oils, but of their, of their synthetic blends. And the reason I'm suggesting a very low 3%, um, I can do what you want, um, but is just for beginners, for safety reasons, the higher you go, the, the higher the chance that essential oils may irritate your skin. Um, now, incidentally, if you want to make a fabric freshener or deodorizing spray or anything like that, you basically make it the same way that you make uh, this perfume, except the ratio is going to be about the opposite. So you're going to have, um, you know, about three quarters water and uh, just a, a little bit of alcohol and then your essential oils. And of course, you use a much larger container uh, and you can easily do that. All right, so why am I recommending this, uh, this little measly 3%? And as I said online, most people are gonna recommend minimum when they're, I watched umpteen YouTube videos of people teaching about perfuming. Um, most, mostly all of them are not aromatherapists or not experienced chemists. Uh, very few of them talked about safety or really got into dilution. And so I wanted to fill in that gap tonight for those of you interested. So if you ever talk to an aromatherapist or anyone who's a real authority on essential oils and they're talking about safety, they are going to just repeat and repeat to you, dilute, 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 because essential oils are strong. They are really potent. Um, so now I talked about this at the beginning, 
but I wanna just show you this again. So different types of fragrances have different, again, percentages, uh, 20 to 30% of the, um, would be the essential oils per perfume and going down. Um, so what I'm suggesting is to make like an eau de cologne. That is gonna affect how long it lasts on you. So a, a perfume, yes, may last up to 12 hours uh, or more. You're only gonna apply it once. Uh, when you're making something a little weaker, like an eau de cologne, um, and that's why it's nice to have these things you can carry in your purse, you will apply it and you might reapply it four hours later. So it won't have the same staying power. So what is a safe dilution for essential oils? I mean, that is um, something that's uh, complicated, but I want you to know a little bit about it, just so you have a sense and you can be more, uh, more of a cautious consumer. Um, so whether, it, how diluted it needs to be is going to vary a lot with the essential skin sensitivity, um, body part, right? So uh, a safe dilution on your, on your arm is gonna be different than when you're putting on your, on your face or more sensitive areas. Uh, frequency of application. So the safety might vary with how often you're putting it on and how much of your body. So if there's something in that essential oil um, that's, I don't like to use the word toxic, but um, all, all natural chemicals and essential oils are just you know, a bunch of natural chemicals. All of them have things in it that at a particular dose could be harmful. So uh, it's the dose that makes the toxin, right? So if we uh, breathe in air, it's not toxic, but actually if you get too much air, uh, too much oxygen, uh, or if you get too little oxygen, but if you get too much air or even too much water, uh, that is toxic and it can kill you. So the same thing is with essential oils. It might be safe to use a little bit, but if you're putting it all over your body and you're absorbing it and you're doing that every day, it's going to change. So kind of the gold standard for what are safe dilutions, this is just very general, but the gold sort of general, if you look out there at, um, you know, and find any resources that are from an aromatherapist, or I get a lot of my information from a site called Tisserand, which is basically just about, they've written like the book for safety. They don't, uh, they don't sell essential oils or have anything. It's just, a, it's just a sort of scientific website. For the body, generally you want a dilution of no more than 2%. This is for adults, for daily use, and for large surface areas of the body. When it comes to the face, you want it to be lower 1%. Um, and doctor may recommend much higher dilutions, 10% or so in a certain area for some kind of a, a um, you know, to treat a, a condition. So it depends. So that's a general idea of safe dilutions, which is why now a perfume is, it's not something you might use it daily, but it's not something that you should be applying to a large surface area. So um, there's a little more safety there than if you're applying a whole body butter. And that's why I kind of picked 3% dilution as maybe uh, a good kind of compromise. And this is uh, just to show you, and then again, this is from the Tisserand Institute that there's a big difference between, as I said, it depends on the essential oil. And what is the maximum safe dilution on the body? So there are some essential oils that really don't have a known maximum dilution. They should always be diluted, but we don't have a sort of maximum that we know. Like, uh, and definitely lavender is going to be in here, lavender or black pepper. So these ones we don't have to worry so much about. Then there's those that we can still use at quite a high percentage, above 10% tea tree, probably a lot of people have put tea tree straight onto their face for acne or such. Um, that is sometimes done, but um, always should be diluted. But certainly there's ones that we can um, 
be a bit more relaxed about. And then there are those that uh, are really, really need to be diluted uh, a lot. And I cinnamon here I highlighted because it's it's the the red flag for me personally. It should be diluted to 0.01 percent. Some essential oils just shouldn't be used on the skin at all. I've seen cinnamon mentioned in a lot of online uh, perfumes, and it's not that it can't be used, but in when it's not emphasized the dilution factor, that's where I get worried. And I personally have had two bad reactions to cinnamon. Um, my first experience was I walked into a, an actual store that was selling essential oils. And this is before I knew a lot. The person came up and she just asked me, oh, are you interested in trying something? She said, tell me about like your, do you have any issues? I said, oh, well, it was cold. I said, oh, my circulation's not great. She grabbed cinnamon, put it straight a drop on each of my arms and rubbed it in. And within seconds, my arms were red and burning. So cinnamon is, uh, it's intense and that's my story. And I also tried to put it in a mixture for a perfume once and the same thing happened on my neck. So now I've learned the hard way <laughs> and that's my, my story. So if you wanna create a 3% dilution, um, it's going to change depending on the, how many drops you use, depending on the size of your container. But once you've made up your whole little mixture that you love, then you're going to take say three drops of that whole mixture to make a 3% dilution in the small container or six drops of your whole mixture for a larger container and so on. When you get into bigger containers, you'll use more. Uh, but I don't want you to have to do the math for this. So luckily I will show you, we have a, I have a, an online calculator that you can use, which is the part of my, the last part of this presentation, which is almost done, is just a few tips that are gonna help you. Now, Elizabeth will share. Uh, you can either use this. Uh, so if you have a 10 ml container. Oh, can you just repeat that and, for a second? Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. I have noticed I keep getting a, thank you, Elizabeth. I keep getting a pop-up message saying the internet connection is, is uh, slow. So I, I um, apologize for that. I will repeat that. So, um, so if you go to nowfoods.ca and you can use this chart to really quickly know how to um, use a, safe dilution. So say you have a 10 ml container that you decide to use a little roll-on. The roll-ons usually are 10, 10 ml. And you want to do a 3% dilution. It tells you right here, you need six drops. You have a larger container, 60 ml, and you want to do a 5% dilution, 60 drops. So that's really easy. But also if you want to really um, customize it and have more flexibility, this online calculator, and I can't show you here because uh, it's not active, but you can select the, the unit, the measurement of your bottle. So say your bottle's in ML, then you can click down on this menu, select milliliters, enter the size of your bottle. So say it's 50 milliliters, enter the desired dilution. You go 5.5 if you want, you can, you know, whatever you want, click there and then you'll get your results. So uh, it's really a really handy online calculator you can use. Uh, now I showed you in the one of the initial pictures of uh, perfumes that when uh, commercially when perfumes were made they use chemicals called fixatives and those help sort of fix that scent in the bottle uh, to keep it to preserve it um, slow down the evaporation rate and improve the scent. So there are certain, uh, some essential oils that are considered to be good fixatives, frankincense, clary sage, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, vetiver. Most of these fixatives incidentally are those lower notes, those base notes, those grounding notes, they fix things. So that's a way to remember that. How to wear your fragrance. And this is all new to me again, because as I said, I've never purchased a perfume, but there's some stuff that I learned. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't in terms of the best place to put the perfume. So I think the reason what I learned that we put perfume on the neck 
which to me is a little, that's a more sensitive area, much like the, the face. So to be a little more cautious, but putting perfume in areas that are uh, like inside the elbows, behind the knees, um, because of the heat, those areas of our body are generally hotter. That will help to, to spread the perfume uh, better. So that's why we select those areas. Um, start with one spray, uh, apply it, don't apply it to dry skin. So um, moisture is going to help that scent to settle. So that either means after a bath, you should be a little more hydrated. You apply your body cream and then the perfume. And that cream is going to also help kind of perfume and walk into it as sometimes suggested. It's basically a waste of that. It's landing all over the place. I did see some suggestions that spraying the hair is one nice place that the hair can it help absorb the scent or sort of is porous? It's not something I've tried, but uh, that makes sense. Also, if you do make a perfume or if you even use perfume, don't apply it more than once a day because it's very concentrated. And as many of us have probably experienced, we have that friend or maybe it was that blind date or whatever it is where you are choking because their perfume is so strong. We adapt to the smell of the perfume and we don't notice it after a while but somebody else will. So perfume once, and if you make the eau de toilette or something, or one of the, the more dilute natural ones that I'm suggesting, then you can apply it maybe every six hours or so. Uh, sometimes, and today I was actually trying to experiment with my vetiver, and I was trying to pour it, and it just wouldn't come out. Uh, so you have certain essential oils that are naturally thicker, in their consistency, or some like a, a vanilla here that are, um, because they're in a mixture with jojoba oil, that oil makes it thicker, it's hard to get them out, especially if you wanna wait for 20 drops. So you can either be very patient, but if it will not come out, you don't wanna microwave your essential oils or something like that, God forbid, although that will do the trick. Uh, one of the tricks I learned online is to warm up some rice so you can microwave the rice so it's warm and then immerse your essential oil in there long enough until it uh, tends to get thin enough to come out. Here are some great resources that I've, uh, I've given to Elizabeth. So she's going to cut and paste them all in your chat area. So you can cut and paste them yourself and then you'll be able to access um, there's lots of information on now.ca uh, from perfuming. So that's that you really want to have that chart that I showed you that's going to be core to get you going. Generally, a lot, of, a lot on there about essential oils and different types of oils. Um, that calculator I mentioned, that's going to be also important. Uh, and there are all kinds of other uh, facts and uh, interesting stuff about quality and safety and so on. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you found that uh, as enjoyable and informative and, and fun, certainly for me as I did. And, uh, and now I am going to have a look and take um, a few questions, but I'm first just going to stop.